uh, uh, several people have mentioned the ocean, uh, Michael Gill and Eugenia, and quickly glossed over it. Eugenia saying she knows nothing about the ocean. Michael didn't have time. And so I thought today I'll talk about the ocean. I've, at least there's uh, two oceanographers in the room now. Elisa Perman also joined us. So I, I feel we have some support. The, I'm going to argue that the ocean is an essential part of the Ice Age cycle. And so the, the first thing we sort of, you can ask what's the key difference between the ocean and atmosphere. They both fluids on a rapidly rotating sphere. Uh, the one is compressible, the one isn't. Uh, and some people refer to the ocean as sort of basically as a wet atmosphere. It's the same equations and the same principles apply. And so you'd think that if you know the ocean, if you know the atmospheric circulation dynamics, you know the ocean. And much of that statement is correct. Uh, however, the, the key difference between the two is the atmosphere is heated from below and the ocean is heated from above. And, the, and so for the atmosphere, it has a fairly simple uh, thermal structure. Uh, there's a convection gives you an adiabatic lapse rate and so on. Uh, the ocean is more puzzling. So if, if you get up in the morning and you want to boil water for your coffee, then you, the strategy you adopt is usually the one on the left. Uh, if you, you could use the strategy on the right, and then you'll have time to read War and Peace, because it's going to take a very long time. But you can get the water boiling by putting it under a broiler. And so the big puzzle in the ocean, the sun has been shining on the ocean now for literally billions of years. And the ocean, the big question in the ocean is it's cold. If you go to the warmest part of the ocean, say the Western Equatorial Pacific, where you get the maximum temperatures around 30 degrees centigrade. If you measure temperatures all the way to the bottom, the average temperature is about 3, 4 degrees centigrade. So the ocean has a remarkably shallow layer of warm water and a very deep layer of uh, cold water. And the top layer, uh, so it's, for practical purposes, it's a two-layer fluid. The top layer is about 100 meters deep. The ocean is about five kilometers deep. And for and the big question in the ocean, why is it so cold? Why isn't there more warm water? The sun's been shining all this time. Uh, if you wanted to put it in more sophisticated terms, you can ask why is the thermocline so shallow? And the word thermocline refers to the interface between the warm water and the cold water. And it's a very sharp interface. So the thermocline is a region of very high vertical density gradients, temperature gradients. Uh, you could bypass this question altogether and ask what are the consequences of a shallow thermocline. And practically all the papers written about El Nino, for example, bypass this question. And it simply exploits the fact. So you take it as a given, the thermocline is shallow, and you ask what are the consequences. And if you read El Nino, so you t take the thermocline, you're told it slightly because of the wind. That exposes cold water in some regions. And explain to you why you have cold water in Galapagos, it's simply because the thermocline is so shallow. So wh what I want to talk about briefly today is uh, why is the ocean so shallow? And it, it, it's a problem that first brought to the attention of scientists in the 1700s. A uh, British ship captain was in a ship in off West Africa, very hot and humid, and he wrote to the Royal Society a letter asking them to please explain why if he lowered a bucket over the side of the ship and pulled up water, he didn't have to go very deep and he could get very cold water. And he said it made his baths very comfortable and it kept his wine cold, but he would like an explanation. And that was in 17 something. And so for the last 200 and odd years, we've been struggling with this problem. And the main conclusion you could drive from this picture is the ocean must be in motion, right? You couldn't, if, if the ocean was stagnant and you've, the sun shines on top, uh, after a few million years, the heat should have diffused down. You'd expect a linear temperature gradient. So you have to assume this ocean must be in Why motion. Or uh, whatever. A <laughs> uh, we'll come back to that issue quickly. Uh, so the, the first guesses were this. 
okay, that the ocean, so if the deep ocean is amazingly homogeneous. It doesn't matter uh, this water down below. Um, yeah. uh, oh, okay. The deep water in the ocean is amazingly, Michael told me to ignore that, um, is amazingly homogeneous. And what happens is that the, and Michael has to show me again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Would you like this? Oh, okay. No, no, this is quite good. <laughs> okay, whatever. Uh, okay, so it's about three, four degrees centigrade, North Pacific, South Atlantic, Southern Ocean. Salinity is about the same, varies very little. And so one conclusion is that the, the source for all this water must be some high latitude. The water must be sinking there. And that's the reason for thinking, this is the first guess for the simulation. Now for the circulation, it turns out after many, many measurements, and I'll just show one measurement. This is a measurement of something called the age of the ocean. So every drop of water has a little bit of carbon-14 in it, and carbon-14 will decay into something else. Uh, the atmosphere has a supply of carbon-14 because of cosmic rays, and then once it gets absorbed in the ocean, it starts decaying. So you can measure the, the age of the ocean with simply be inferred from the concentration of carbon-14 as you uh, move around. So you can see the ocean, the water seems to be sinking in the North Atlantic because that's where you get the youngest water. So this would be the measurement, I don't know, 2,000 meters at some depth. Uh, over here you get very old water, over here fairly young. And so people infer the circulation for the ocean sinking in the North Atlantic going down. And so the color bar is in years? Is in years, must be. Oh, yeah. So it's only... So uh, around here is 1,000. 200 years. No, no, it's about 800 years. It's the oldest water in the ocean. But I'm, I'm sorry, when you say age of water... It's when it last was at the surface. Oh, okay, age of water. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, people, now people came up with this one. And this is a very famous one. If you go to the movies often, you'll actually see animations of this. If you watch a movie called uh, Day After Tomorrow or watch Al Gore's movie forgotten what it's called. Uh, they have animations of this. Both very bad. Uh, anyway, uh, it turns out the movie is actually quite wrong. Uh, the, the, this picture is incorrect, even though it's very popular. Now, uh, it turns out uh, the problem that Michael mentioned yesterday, the big, big mistake, or the big problem in this picture is this water as it comes up has to be warmed up. And so it's usually assumed that downward diffusion is balancing upward advection. And that that balance is what causes the, that balance is what causes the equation. So you, you write down some equation for the conservation of heat and say this is capital T, Z, Z. And you assume that these two terms are balancing. Okay, and so people go and measure kappa, and as we speak, there are ships go sailing around trying to measure kappa. And as Michael said yesterday, kappa is absurdly small. It's too small, he said, whales may contribute <laughs> to this mixing. Uh, we can't find a place where this water can come up because it's so cold. And because uh, the, the diffusion and the mixing is so incredibly small in the ocean, there's almost no vertical or horizontal mixing. And the conclusion in the end is that this picture is wrong, and a very recent article uh, summarized sort of a convergence of opinion. The water comes up around Antarctica. And th this is obviously, so around the Earth is actually, the water does not come up there. Uh, this gets ventilated from the south, uh, from Antarctica. The only place the water sinks, this part is correct, it sinks there. And then the rest gets ventilated and flows out again. And if it comes up in Antarctica, Temperature gradients are so small you don't need much mixing. Okay, because there's almost no temperature difference between the top and the bottom of the ocean around Antarctica. Okay, so as I said, this picture is wrong. If you ask why is the Atlantic singled out, uh, this is a fascinating picture. The Atlantic is much more salty than the Pacific. And the, so the, I'll come back to this. The density of the ocean depends on both temperature and salinity. Uh, salty water is heavier than fresh water. If you 
want to practice walking on water, you should go to the Dead Sea. <laughs> <laughs> it's so salty, you, you can't drown there. Uh, so the reason why we have this, if somebody's looking for a PhD thesis, we actually don't have a good explanation. Why is the ocean? Why is this so much salty? This is evaporation minus precipitation. If there was no motion in the ocean, these pictures should have been the same. But so anyway, here's the interesting puzzle for you. Why is the Atlantic so salty? We'll come back to some of the consequences. We actually haven't solved that problem entirely. So the water rises around Antarctica, and then the winds take over. And this is the circulation of the wind-driven circulation. So in the upper ocean, you have very inhomogeneous conditions, big changes in temperature, big changes in density, and you have the wind blowing. So here, we've constantly been coming up about the role of passion in oceanography and, or in science in general. The people who produced the first picture, which the time scale is a thousand years, are geochemists. We cannot measure those currents directly. And it's the problem I mentioned yesterday. Uh, it's not even clear that you can, from current measurements, say much about the thermohaline circulation. And there's a big debate. So the first one is called thermohaline circulation because it, uh, haline refers to salt. Uh, this is the Mahaline. This is the domain of geochemists. And uh, never mind. <laughs> and there's big debates. And so this is the domain of the dynamicists. They measure these currents. The Kurushio you see there is so swift, more than a meter a second, you can measure with a current meter. So you have an entirely different group of oceanographers who deal with a wind driven upper circulation. Uh, this, people know, in each ocean basin there's, so this is the trajectory of a fluid parcel over a 30 year period, and it's every month. So here the parcel's moving very fast, the color tells you the depth, here it's at the surface, it goes down. So the key thing to notice, this wind-driven circulation has a horizontal component, and the horizontal component, the characteristic, is a very intense jet on the western side of the basin and then the return flow is much slower. And there's one in the Atlantic, there's one in every ocean basin, there are similar currents. So you have a horizontal gyre, and explaining that is a challenge, that one has been solved. There is also a vertical component. Here the water parcels are at the surface, they subduct, a term taken from geology. And the depth, you can see uh, here they're moving very fast, uh, monthly movements, and ultimately they rise back to the surface, find their way. Some of them find their way to the equator. There's a peculiar current flowing eastward, comes up to the surface, and then here it finds its way back again. These are the trajectories over some 30 years. So the time scale for this circulation is a few decades, as opposed to the time scale for the other one, which is a uh, millennium. The key thing to note the ocean, therefore, has two components to circulation. Here's the North Atlantic, it seeps into the deep ocean, rises here. This is the shallow one. So the wind-driven circulation, the winds converge, the currents force them to subduct here, upwelling at the equator, and it goes back. And here I just showed that the wind-driven circulation theories worked out. It was thought this was the balance. That's not correct. You can drop this, it's so small. And so if you ask why does the thermocline persist there, as the water is constantly getting replenished, moves up, uh, gains heat from the atmosphere, moves, loses the heat, comes back down, and wind convergence. So the key thing is there are two conveyor belts. So everybody knows about a conveyor belt, and everybody thinks it refers strictly to this one. There is a second conveyor belt. And for example, in the Pacific, this one is primarily responsible for transporting heat poleward. Uh, there's in, in fact, you cannot really divorce the two circulations from each other. Uh, you're obliged to marry them uh, because what comes down there, comes up around here, has to get back to the North Atlantic, has to participate in the wind-driven circulation. But a particle doesn't really know whether it participates in one or the or other. Or the other. Of artificial. Yes, it's artificial separation. So the marriage, you can ask what determines the depth of the thermocline. And what this transport does is to, um, in, in fact, let me just show you. So the, the first person who looked into this, uh, I'll, I'll get back to a second. Uh, you know, experiments with very simple models. You take a box of water, 10 degrees centigrade, 
and you have a boundary condition, the atmosphere, T star, is at 20 degrees centigrade. And so the ocean gains heat from the atmosphere. And I ask you, what is the end result? And you can anticipate the end result is the water will be at 20 degrees centigrade. That, that's an obvious solution. And you run some experiment, you can see there's initially some wind-driven circulation, very rapid, and then very gradual diffusion. So ultimately, this depends on diffusive processes, and in due course, if we go on, the whole box will be that. However, if you arrange the boundary condition so that the net flux of heat across the ocean <coughs> surface is zero, you lose heat in some regions, gain in pole, you get an entirely different circulation, and you get a thermocline. And so the thermocline, what's going on now is there's a circulation, and the ocean gains heat here, but it loses the heat here. And so the answer here is that the depth of the thermocline really depends on this graph. Uh, this shows you where the ocean gains most of its heat, where it loses most of its heat. Okay, and th this loss of heat is, there's a very warm Gerushio, a very warm Gulf Stream. In winter, cold air coming off the continents lose huge amounts of heat. And in a state of equilibrium, this must equal to this. And in a state of equilibrium then, uh, if you ask, this loss is controlled by the atmosphere. Happens only in winter and happens when cold air comes over the ocean. This gain depends on the depth of the thermocline. If the thermocline is very shallow, you can expose cold water, the ocean gains heat. So you can now argue the depth of the thermocline is really determined by the heat budget of the ocean, by the loss. And Ilya Zipperman first pointed this out, I think it was part of your PhD thesis or something shortly afterwards, that it's sort of ironic the diabatic processes that we have so much trouble with is actually the reason that the processes that determine ultimately the depth of the thermocline. From the paleo uh, considerations, this is a major thing, and I'll come back to this later. This tells you, this, remember I said there's cold water at the equator today. That's where the ocean gains most of its heat. Uh, if the, uh, suppose we shut this off, suppose there's global warming and winters become very warm and the ocean no longer loses heat. The tropics won't know at first, so it keeps on gaining heat and the thermocline goes deep. So you can control thermocline depth at the equator from high latitudes by just warming up the high latitudes or cooling it off. And this is exactly what, for example, obliquity does. If you change the tilt of the Earth's axis, if you increase the tilt slightly, it makes the poles warmer, the loss of heat from the ocean will reduce, and the tropics will also warm up because the thermocline will go down. Uh, and so we have a test for this possible theory by looking at the response to obliquity. Come back to that later. Let me for a moment continue with salt. So I said uh, the thermohaline depends on salt. Salt does two things. Uh, Density depends on two things. Density of the ocean depends on temperature and salt. As you go poleward, it gets colder and the density increases. But as you go poleward, it rains a lot more and the water gets fresher. So these two things are actually in opposition to each other. Uh, the one causes, uh, you, and you could see if I took, should have written it down, but if I write down the first derivative of this a change in density. I can actually get the change in density to be zero if this balances that. And so if I can get at the surface the salinity at the high latitude to be so low that it compensates for the change in temperature, then there could be no change in density at the surface. And that's called the thermohaline breakdown. So it, it turns out everybody in, in this movie, if you haven't seen it, it it's a terrible movie, but the uh, but the visuals are spectacular, so uh, watch it for that purpose. The theme of the movie is the thermohaline circulation breaks down and uh, I stay, uh, the heat being transported to the North Atlantic to keep Western Europe <coughs> nice and mild, uh, that is shut off and uh, there's snowstorms and floods and uh, Mexico features in that movie because the Americans try to rush to Mexico <laughs> to escape the heat. And then the, the border is the opposite of the problem supposedly we have today, where people are going to do not people actually try to go south <laughs> <laughs> to get away from it. Anyway, so do watch this movie. Uh, the motivation for the movie is this thermohaline circulation. 
<laughs> so, uh, so there's big concern, and all around the peop world, people with big climate models are doing experiments where they pour fresh water under the North Atlantic to see what will happen. And the big fear is that if the ice over Greenland should start melting, it will pour fresh water the, onto the Atlantic, and the poor Europeans are going to suffer dreadfully. <laughs> they have to move to Mexico to, and to get some better climate. The, anyway, it, whether this is the case or not, uh, as I said, we can't test these theories because the time scale for these things is thermohaline is a thousand years. Again, uh, George, you, know, you, can't, you can't stop the Gulf Stream without stopping the rotation of the Earth. <laughs> well, that's uh, a, 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 a chemist don't know this. I should point out this is a man from Hollywood, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> they, they should have consulted you when they made this well, movie. They, that there was a guy who <laughs> has a consulting thing for science and did contact me when I was a you, you were not persuasive. Well, <laughs> anyway, what I want to point out to you is that what happens now is in this picture, if you pour fresh water there, you make the water so buoyant it doesn't sink, and you shut off the circulation. And uh, one big fear is this deep ocean is very cold. Uh, one reason that's important is that it has far more carbon dioxide than the surface of waters. So once we allow the deep water to start warming up, then basically it's like your beer. Right? If, if the bubbles, you see a CO2, and if you want to get rid of the bubbles, warm up your beer, and the bubbles will go away. So if this should happen to the deep ocean, then CO2 in the atmosphere will suddenly increase enormously. So there's also some reasons to be concerned about shutting down the circulation. However, I want to point out here, if you were to make this water very fresh, you can have the same impact. You can also shut down the shallow wind-driven circulation, the overturning. And the consequences are quite astonishing. The consequences are here. Yeah. So we took some ocean basin uh, model. This is depth. Uh, this is looking down on it. And so initially, we blow a wind. There's upwelling at the equator. There's cold water. And this water goes poleward. It warms up there, goes down, and so on. We maintain this thermal structure then all we do is pour more and more fresh water onto the northern boundaries. And astonishingly, you can cause El Nino by inducing fresh water, uh, uh, simply by changing the density of the surface, ocean surface. Okay, so we now have two separate processes for causing El Nino. So uh, most of the papers for El Nino is uh, you tilt the thermocline. So you, you have this thermocline. If there was no motion in the ocean, it would be horizontal. You blow a wind to the west, it slopes like this. You relax the winds, and it goes back. That's the mechanism for El Nino. It's, it's adiabatic, and all you're doing is redistributing warm water. We now have a different one, a diabatic <coughs> mechanism. Do this one. The time scale for this is much longer. And we coined the term uh, permanent El Nino for this. So if the thermocline goes down, the cold water in the eastern Pacific will disappear, and You'll have this state, and I think Eli will talk today or tomorrow about possible theories. Under what conditions could, you, could this happen? Okay, so, so today we live in a peculiar world where the thermocline is very shallow, and where we can have things like El Nino, where we do have a meridional overturning circulation for the ocean. It transports heat poleward. But I would submit this is actually an unusual state of affairs. Most of the history of the planet, if you go back to the Cretaceous, when the dinosaurs were around, the thermocline was very deep, and there actually is independent evidence. The, cold, the deep ocean has been cooling off over the last 60 million years. Uh, thermocline rises in response, and around 3 million years ago is when we suddenly start getting cold water at the equator. And here you can see the evidence. So the, the reason, this is the picture I showed yesterday, the paleo temperature in the Western Pacific, it's always been warm over the seven million years. The Eastern Pacific, all these other upwelling places, it's gotten much colder. Okay, so this, I would submit, what happened at three million years ago was not just that glaciers appeared over <coughs> the northern hemisphere, and then the glaciers introduced the feedback, and the feedback led to the cooling. So here you see a clear trend, and the trend I submitted yesterday, the, this is ice volume, you see a clear trend. That cooling trend, that's accelerated from about here onward. 
was A, due to glaciers appearing. Glaciers then give you albedo feedback, and once you have glaciers, it gets colder and colder. I would submit that the appearance of cold water also gives you a feedback, also albedo, but it's a cloud feedback. And it basically works like this. This is our sea surface temperature pattern today. This is the corresponding rainfall pattern. Where the water is cold, you have these big banks of stratus clouds. If you were to fly from here to Hawaii, you would see clouds underneath you most of the way. By the time you get to Hawaii, they disappear. So I would submit these are the tropical counterparts of polar glaciers that reflect sunlight. That, uh, and the reason is you have to gain, the ocean has to gain heat at the equator to export polewood. Uh, the water is so cold that stratus clouds form over them. You're in a low latitude, sunlight is intense. They reflect sunlight, so they deprive the ocean of heat. Now the thermocline has to get even shallower so that it can maintain the seed budget. And as a consequence, you get this result. And I must emphasize it with pure speculation at this stage. I'll come back to how do we verify this. But you can have this cooling, I would submit, is in part due to these what I call tropical glaciers. It's basically the areas of cold water will expand enormously during ice age. Uh, then they contract during periods such as today, uh, during interglacials. The, where are we in the story now? So the picture, uh, this for Eugenie's benefit, uh, is a blow up. Sorry, I don't quite get it. Are these other cumulus decks uh, Synchronous with the glaciers expanding or contracting? Or yeah, so um, I could show you a big. Uh, okay. So, just so the, the, just the timing of I uh, didn't follow quite your. Uh, Okay, so we have, th this is for temperature, and we have lots of temperature plots over the last three million years. The correspondence, it's not so obvious from this particular graph, the correspondence between this picture and this is a completely independent picture. This is ice volume. It's quite remarkable. They both, from this point on, are dominated by obliquity oscillations. They both have a trend. They both around this time switch to a sawtooth signal. And the sort of signals are correlated. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the correspondence between the tropical sea surface temperatures and the glaciers is quite astonishing. You could, so one school of thought would say glaciers are dominant, they control everything. The transfer of fresh water from the ocean to the continent is enormous. It, it's, um, let's say, just 160 meters at a peak. So if you make the calculation, how does the heat budget of the ocean affect it during that time, then it should not have had, it, it's over such a long time, it's happening over 100,000 years, that uh, evaporation is not an important factor. So the glaciers by themselves cannot be responsible for this picture. I'm sorry, for, the, for that picture. I, I cannot just, uh, by arguing glaciers wax and wane, that this caused the changes in temperature. That doesn't work out if you put in the numbers. So I'm saying the ocean has an independent mechanism on its own, but the ocean needs the collaboration of the of the of the glaciers because it has to put the fresh water somewhere. And this comes back to this picture well, now. My question is one of phasing. I mean, you know, which ones are the clouds and which ones are the I don't think we can get around that one. What I'm going to argue now is that in this picture. This breakdown, if, if we go from this green region to there, it would go from this state to that state. And so I'm going to argue that this... So, so this is the world we're in today. Yeah. If I were to pour a lot of fresh water onto the ocean, we will have this world. I'll go fr from there to there. Mm -hmm. And it's simply I've shut down the, the shallow circulation. So... Uh, if I do that, I've basically crossed the threshold. Okay, so I'm going to argue that what happens as the ocean gets colder and colder, uh, what happens in uh, where is this picture now? What happens here as the ocean gets colder and colder, it's also getting saltier and saltier. All the evaporation took place at the ocean surface. I showed you a picture before of ocean salinity. It's a complicated thing. The highest salt 
emptiness in the ocean is actually at the surface. It's in the warm regions. So I would argue the ocean's extremely salty by the time you get to a glacial maximum. So at this stage, if the glaciers, for some reason, start melting, you would suddenly jump to a completely different state. So I claim that the glaciation, I said we discussed yesterday, when the glaciers get too big, geothermal heat will start breaking them up. Uh, I will claim once they start breaking up, they pour the fresh water in the ocean. The whole thing gets reinforced by this mechanism. The trigger for the whole thing is the increase in obliquity. So if you increase sunlight in high latitudes, you promote the breakup of the glaciers, you promote the flow of fresh water onto the ocean. All of this is speculation and comes to how are we going to confirm that this is right or wrong. There's no way we can get information about cloudiness in the past. Uh, we, that people are working on the problem, but how do you measure, how do you get salinity information in the past? So at the moment, you should be skeptical. You could get cloudiness if you had fossil coral. Uh, Okay, we will go into that another case. So anyway, my analysis of what's going on, uh, yesterday I said there are three possible worlds. Uh, suppose there's a world with no Milankovitch, then I would claim uh, no Milankovitch cycles. I would claim you could still have ice age cycles, that starting around three million years you'd have a trend, and then you'd reach a threshold, and you would go up and then. The reason why this is so much quicker than that is that around this time, there's independent evidence that CO2 and dust became important factors in the atmosphere and feedbacks. And I immediately say we, we don't know the explanation, but it's some measurements by Danny Sigmund and Hoag's people in Switzerland, showing that the, at least the dust concentration looks remarkably like this. So presumably it got colder, it got less humid in the atmosphere, clouds became more abundant. We know for a fact dust became much more abundant in the atmosphere. And then dust subsequently has this. So I will claim the sawtooth signal is some interplay between glaciers and the tropical Pacific. It was, if you ask why did it only start here, its precursor was this one. So one intriguing implication here is that if we, if we accept this hypothesis that CO2 played a big role here, that we actually have some crude measure of how important CO2 is. Michael was talking about climate sensitivity. So without CO2, it took from three to one million years to get there. And now it only takes 100,000 years to get there. These cycles repeat. Uh, if uh, the thing I'm, this is, so I'm claiming we go back and forth here from that state to that state by pouring more or less fresh water onto the ocean. Just for Eugenia's I had a picture I wanted to show her. Uh, the actual data, this is the actual data for the last, I wanted time on the right and the plot I got hold of her time to the left. But these are the actual measurements. You could see how remarkably simple this is. And so there should be abundant tests. I'm claiming that these periods should have a lot in common and that these periods should be entirely different. Okay, so in anyway, I'll talk to Henia later on. But these are actual measurements. And so I would submit there actually are tests for this idea, that I would claim that during this period, we're in this, the, my pictures are complete, anyway, that in, during that period we hear, it, it, that this is the counterpart to it. We've moved back and forth. Uh, well, I'm running ahead of myself. Sorry, uh, would you be, would you go slowly on what the, one of those so two, uh, the mechanism that you, oh, okay. you are describing because it's, it's a lot of information. Okay, so during this period, the cold, the, there's cold water at the equator, the ocean has an overturning circulation. At the same time, there have glaciers have appeared, <coughs> if we go back to three million years. So at this point, two new feedbacks enter the picture, both the albedo feedbacks. And that makes the system unstable. The, the glaciers, once you put them there, will grow by themselves because they reflect sunlight, temperatures fall, more precipitation is snow, glaciers get bigger, so forth. And it doesn't work for the southern hemisphere that well because once you've covered that Antarctica with snow, you have nowhere else to go. It works for the northern hemisphere. So that's why ice appeared over Antarctica about 35 million years ago. 
but we didn't start having ice ages then. We only started having it three million years ago. And that's when the northern hemisphere got glaciers. I'm claiming that the second thing happened around this time, cold water appears at the equator. So now the ocean is transporting heat poleward. However, clouds form over that, so there's a feedback involved. Clouds form over the cold water. So this also pushes temperature down. But this only succeeds, so this is an ocean mechanism, thermocline moving up and down. It doesn't affect the Western Pacific that much. It affects the Eastern Pacific. It affects the upwelling regions. It doesn't affect really the regions that are already warm. Okay. So I would claim, and then you need a pacer. If there was no Milankovitch forcing, this would happen randomly, and the time series would be irregular. So Peter Hoybus has a nice paper. Each of these things coincides with an increase in obliquity. Okay. So the increase in obliquity is the pacer for this. Okay. So the story is we have trends. Trends leads to thresholds. At the threshold, you reverse the same feedbacks that supported the trend will now support the reverse trend. Okay. And then you go through this process repeatedly. So this one is one set of ice age cycles. You need not invoke Milankovitch, except to paste the thing. Then in addition, there are two other so ice ages. Sorry, you don't invoke? Except for a pacer. Except in the, at the beginning of the... Yeah, and at the end, the pacer is what is Milankovitch. Sorry? The pacer. It's like somebody's heart has a pacer and keeps his heart going. Heart <laughs> okay. So in addition, there are two additional ice age cycles. I would claim obliquity by itself can induce ice age cycle. Okay. And it's the same feedback, but this time, uh, what obliquity does is cause the sunlight next summer to be slightly, say, lower than the sunlight the previous summer. So the snow that falls during winter not all of it melts during summer, and it accumulates gradually. <coughs> so there is a, a 40,000 uh, obliquity cycle in ice ages. And uh, th that's another part of the story. And then the third one would be precession. We won't have time to get to that today, but there's a precession signal. And the key thing is the Obliquity is a redistribution of sunlight. If you take a sphere, you shine the sun on it, all you do is change the tilt. The net amount of sunlight on the sphere hasn't changed. So what obliquity does is redistribute it in space. What precession does is to redistribute it in time. It, it makes summers warmer, winters colder. And so precession is a very high frequency forcing. Average over a year, there is no precession. Okay, it's modulated by 23,000 years. But just if you take average annual sunlight to simulate precession, there won't be a precession signal because the average over a year is zero. Okay, so we have two forcing functions with entirely different spatial temporal structures. They induce entirely different spatial temporal signals. And I will claim that is the, that is sort of at the heart of, <coughs> I've lost my, picture. Uh, yesterday I showed you a, a slide where say the caves in China behave one way, the tropical Pacific behaves to exactly the same force in a different way, the Atlantic behaves differently. We can now sort that out that we're dealing, continents respond very quickly, the atmosphere responds very quickly, so you can get big precession signals within a season they can adjust. The ocean cannot, takes at least a decade. The glacier certainly cannot. So you should not expect precession signals in glaciers or in the Pacific Ocean, it's just too big. You can expect it in monsoon. So the cave in China is completely dominated by precession. So I'm arguing that this superposition of three signals can explain the records we have. Uh, let me just summarize, I'm running out of time, I want to leave time for questions. So what we've, you've heard in these series of lectures are talks on three different topics. The one concerns observations. Everybody showed observations at some point. One, idealized models, and that's what I gather the people in this room are expert on. And then Machosa gave us talks about these ones. And we, as I said yesterday, you, you cannot have science without observations. It's essential. The problem here is positive observations and large uncertainties.
We have idealized models and they're invaluable and we've heard lots of talks about idealized. Now I've just shown you results from idealized models where I would pour fresh water and so on. The problem here is they make available a big spectrum of results. And for example, the, the one big debate at the moment is about rainfall in the tropics, what determines where it rains. Some people will tell you that if you change high latitude conditions, it's the equated to pole temperature gradient, it affects the tropics. So there are papers that say if you have glaciers, the tropical rainfall will move this way or that way. There's uh, separate idealized models tell you, I'm telling you, it's Asia interaction in the tropics that's at the heart of the matter. Uh, a third group of people will tell you, John Marshall just has a paper, the thermohaline circulation in the Atlantic affects the position of the ITCZ in the Pacific. I submit all these people are correct, and it's a matter of degree. So the, the process uh, rainfall in the tropics depends on many, many factors. Depends on all the ones I just mentioned. Uh, uh, is, are they, is any particular one 10% important, or 50, or 100%? We don't actually know, that's where we are stuck, that's where we need these models. The problem with these models is that they're imperfect. They're okay for today, there's really no reason to believe they're okay for some other time. Uh, the problem is clouds. Uh, one simple example is the last glacial maximum is attributed to huge glaciers which reflected sunlight, kept the planet cold, and the other Sunlight, by the way, 20,000 years ago was about the same as it is today. Okay, so to explain the presence of the glaciers, the big difference is there's no glaciers today compared to then. I would submit, I've just given some explanation, that clouds could be another factor. How do we know that clouds were not a big deal? CO2 was much lower 20,000 years ago. We have accurate measurements of CO2. And so the answer to Michael's question becomes really difficult, uh, sensitivity to this climate. You could say the last glacial maximum is a test. We know CO2 was much lower. How much did that contribute to cold conditions at that time? Uh, we don't have an answer because we don't know to what degree clouds played a role. We don't know to what degree a change in ocean circulation played a role. There are all sorts of other factors. So, this, so we have a hand. We need to integrate all these. We can't focus on any one of these. We need to integrate all of them to make progress. The only problem on which we've had complete, I shouldn't say complete, but enormous success is weather prediction. Weather prediction has actually succeeded in marrying those three topics. So if you ask a meteorologist for data, everybody wants data, the atmospheric conditions a week ago, Surprisingly, what they'll give you is the output from a model. Okay, so they've made, they have an enormous network of stations measuring around the globe. The measurements are not complete, there are gaps in the system. Some of the instruments could be wrong. You, okay, they will talk about this later today, you can have data simulation, improves the whole matter. So we've had enormous success there. We've had some success with the seasonal cycle. So we divide the seasonal cycle into two problems. One is forced variability, one is natural variability. Uh, for the forced part, so variability in the atmosphere, in climate, whatever, uh, has two components. So when you're talking about forced, are you talking about the anthropogenic or, or Whatever, anything that's forced, anything external to the system. Right, so sunlight is certainly you're external. The sun, I mean, for the cycle. What's that? Yeah, the sun is the seasonal cycle. Anthropogenic is included, it's, we're increasing CO2, so we're forcing the system. There's hope in predicting this. This, all the chaos theory and so on, concerns natural variability. Okay, so weather has a very limited, so the, the ocean atmosphere coupled with glaciers is an incredibly complicated system with many modes of oscillation. Those modes of oscillation, many are due to instabilities. As a consequence, the predictability is limited. And we've heard several talks on that topic, but uh, I cannot tell you what the weather will be one week from today. I can tell you it's going to be different six months from now, and I turn to this part for that information. So we've made progress here that the green refers to that. Uh, we identify the climatology, and I describe why the climatology is a, is a completely artificial concept. You never experience the climatology, but it's a very useful concept. It filters out uncertainties. It focuses, it filters out this. If you want to 
have an idealized model we do for the seasonal cycle. We specify a mean state, we look at the oscillations on the mean state. Uh, this mean state that we have to specify is the orbital parameters. We have to specify where the glaciers are, atmospheric CO2, all the things that cannot adjust within a year. We have to specify and we trust our model to reproduce the rest. So we've made some progress there with the idlers model. Here we stuck. Uh, it turns out that weather actually affects the seasonal cycle. Right? Uh, weather transports heat poleward. So if Chicago has mild winters, much milder than it should, it's because of weather. Okay, so, so we may resent in the North America the very harsh winters, but they actually contribute to keeping the climate much milder than it otherwise would be. We have not succeeded in this part, in, in that part. Uh, and so that's why we have these debates about what determines position of ITCZ, of the tropical rainfall and so on. I would submit this is the key to improving our models. Okay, so so Machoso is working on these enormous models with better clouds, and he tells us the resolution has to be a kilometer or something. There's no way that you could run 100,000 year cycles repeatedly to improve your cloud parameterization. So what I'm proposing is we could run repeated seasonal cycles, and that we could, you have to specify certain things, and then you use the model to calculate the rest, and you can tune that. And I would argue the change in the mean state comes from, so we have three components, and the change in the mean state comes from these two. Okay, they change, this I just argued, this changes the thermocline depth, for example. Okay, uh, that is part of the mean state. It determines in part the tropical. So I'm arguing that the combination of, uh, we have to focus on this one. This becomes a crucial test for data. It's the only thing we can manage with our big models is the seasonal cycle. Precession tells you basically what the seasonal cycle is, was like in the past, how it changed. It tells you how the seasonal cycle was modulated by these two things. And so the, uh, okay. In conclusion, I just wanted to say, I think, oh my, my the, most of the picture isn't there. <laughs> okay. The, this is the picture we have today. Uh, we have models that can, and, and this is basically a reflection of rainfall. This is chlorophyll, so it tells you where rain is absent, where rain is heavy, where it's minimal. In the oceans, it tells you, uh, just briefly, on land, vegetation depends mostly on temperature, on rainfall, and to some degree on nutrients in the ground. You can ask what determines climate zones in the ocean. Uh, you need light for photosynthesis, so the ocean surface, the upper layer of the ocean has most of the life. When that life dies, it sinks into the deep ocean, so the deep ocean is rich in nutrients. As a consequence, if you have regions where the deep water gets to the surface, then you have extremely productive, biologically productive areas. So m most of the oxygen we breathe, much of the CO2 that's absorbed by the ocean doing us the favor, happens around here, happens around there, in all these fertile areas. These are basically deserts. So wherever you have very cold water is where you have very water rich in nutrients coming to the surface where there's lots of light. And that's what you need. The, I don't think there's any biogeochemists here. There's a big debate. You need more than that for life. And a, a big puzzle in biogeochemistry is there is actually less life than there ought to be given all the favorable conditions. And it's thought that iron is a missing element. And so the, earlier I mentioned dust. Uh, a big source of iron for uh, life forms in the ocean comes from dust, from the deserts. And so the increase in <coughs> dust during cold periods means that uh, it's going to lower CO2 because the dust then provides the missing element. The bugs grow, they take CO2 out of the atmosphere. So you can see there's the makings of very complicated feedback into this thing. Dust suddenly becomes a very important factor, so the CO2. So I'll conclude there, and uh, uh, I just wanted to show this one picture that we, I think we can shed light on. And 
ask you if any questions. The missing picture I wanted to show you is. I hate Mr. Jopes, unless you have. Yeah, the track pads. Yeah, it's impossible. Uh, sweat sensitive and other. Yeah, uh, let me just see. Well, click the green button. You will have uh, the picture I wanted to show you is, uh, is this one. Mm. Oh, maybe that. Uh, okay. So th these are records, and they look completely different. This is all precession in some regions. This is the sawtooth thing I was mentioning. The surprising thing is how similar the tropical Atlantic is to the sawtooth. So the puzzle is to explain why do you get this completely different responses. And I would submit we're well on our way to understand. Is it Atlantic? The Pacific, this is, a, is this a record from the Pacific? The arrows point to where the, the, yeah, the record yeah, is yeah. from, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. 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 yeah, anyway, so we, we have a fascinating puzzle. We're basically dealing with sort of the counterpart of three superimposed seasonal cycles. The seasonal cycle today is already a problem. Uh, we can't explain all of it. We shouldn't explain an easy solution to this problem of ice ages. And tests in the end is the <coughs> big thing. Uh, Eli will, one test is three million years ago. Why was it warm at that time? The models cannot reproduce it. Uh, what I'll point out here is that um, is that the superposition of these different forcing functions. Did I, oh, I did have it on that one. Uh, the bottom picture here, this one, is a superposition of, this is taken from astronomical calculations, obliquity and precession. I've just said that they have completely different, they induce different responses. So it will be interesting to contrast, say, a period such as that one with a period such as this one, where they're almost reinforcing each other, or this one. You can see there are various periods when it's upside down. So on the basis of this one, can actually isolate particular occasions in the past where you would expect the response to be quite different because of these different superpositions. So I'll claim that we actually have an abundance of tests available for, test, for determining whether these hypotheses I've thrown out are valid or not. And that it's a matter, and we can actually make suggestions to the paleo people as to which occasions merit particular interest. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and see if you have any questions. Thank you.